I'll give you a two-minute warning okay, still. Cool. I want to make sure everyone's through the door, through security. <clears throat> check, check, check. One, two. Check, check, check. One, two. Six or seven still in line. All right. Six or seven people still in yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saving so, my batteries. So there's another back door. If you all want to go around back, and there's actually seats in the back, though, if you want. I know you're going to get it. But you can have pen and pad. So, up to you. Um, whatever's easier. Um, so, we got your this area clear. Mic check, check, one, two, mic check, one, two. Okay, so this is two minute warning right now, okay? Two minutes. So this little area, we're going to need this when they come in, you can file back in. Sorry, go ahead. There you go. Mike, check one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Anybody see a thermostat? Hey, if it's sitting outside, it feels good to me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mic check, one, two, three, four, five. Mic check, one, two, three, four, five. Mic check, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Mic check, one more, one more. Does anybody need one? Okay, check. Okay, great. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Cullen. I'm the United States Attorney for the Western District of Virginia. I'm joined this afternoon by Eric Dryben, who is the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division in Washington, D.C., and David Archie, who is the Special Agent in Charge for the FBI's Richmond Division, uh, which covers Charlottesville. I also have uh, Virginia State Police First Sergeant Dino Capuzzo, um, who was personally involved in the Unite the Right uh, criminal investigations, working closely with our office as well as our case agents uh, who worked so hard on this case, 5,000 hours uh, of video evidence, interviews, and the like, and my two line prosecutors, Chris Cavanaugh and Risa Burkauer. On August 12, 2017, James Fields committed a hate-inspired act of domestic terrorism that killed 32-year-old Heather Heyer and seriously wounded over 30 people. The injuries that he inflicted on those folks who survived that attack were severe. They had fractured skulls, broken backs, broken arms and legs, damaged organs. They have suffered untold psychological and emotional harm, mental illness, post-traumatic stress disorder. As they so elo eloquently stated today, their lives truly will never be the same. As a result of this act of domestic terrorism that was charged as 29 hate crimes, a United States District Judge this afternoon determined that Mr. Fields deserved to spend the rest of his life in federal prison and imposed that sentence. We at this podium believe that is an acceptable and appropriate outcome in this case, and I personally am grateful 
for the courage and determination of our victims who've had to live through this ordeal for the last two years, for the hard work and dedication of the agents who worked this case from the day it happened 22 months later, the FBI and the Virginia State Police. And I'm, I'm also very grateful for Eric and his team's involvement, the experts in the Civil, right, the Civil Rights Division at Maine Justice. They played an integral role in this case. And with that, I'd like to introduce Eric. Thank you, Thomas. The defendant committed an act of disgraceful white supremacist violence. He killed Heather Heyer. He could have killed many others. And in fact, he injured or attempted to injure or kill at least 30 other persons. He committed these atrocious acts of violence because of his white supremacist racial bias. He harmed this whole community and he harmed our country through despicable racial violence. In just a few months, we will celebrate the 10th anniversary of Congress's enactment of the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Today, this defendant will spend the rest of his life in prison for violating that law. Hate-filled violence based on white supremacy and racism is anathema to our country and our society. Hate crimes violate the most fundamental American values of freedom and human dignity. And our country cannot and will not tolerate violent crime, especially violent crime motivated by racial bias. In particular, the bigotry and ideology of neo-Nazism, Nazism, white supremacy, and the Ku Klux Klan are a disgrace to this country, and illegal acts based on those should be eradicated from the United States. And the Department of Justice has been and will continue fully to prosecute anyone who commits or perpetuates hate crimes. Anyone who is even thinking about committing such a crime should know and should be on notice. Our government will use its immense power and resources to identify the perpetrators of hate crimes, investigate and prosecute them, lock them up, and protect our communities from racial violence. Since January 2017, the department has indicted more than 50 defendants involved in committing these atrocious hate crimes. These include cases where defendants acted because of race, sexual orientation, religion, including Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, and other protected categories. In addition to this prosecution today, other recent examples include bringing hate crimes charges in January of this year for the murder of congregants at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In October 2018, for the racially motivated murder of two African-American patrons at a Kroger grocery store and the attempted murder of a third in Jeffersontown, Kentucky. And earlier this month, for the arson of three African-American churches in Louisiana. We are also working across the department to do all we can to prevent hate crimes and to prosecute such crimes. We are conducting outreach and training to local communities, providing support and technical assistance to local law enforcement, and providing grants to examine better ways to identify hate crimes. And the Justice Department will continue to fight white supremacist discrimination wherever and whenever it occurs, including in employment, housing, voting, education, and all other areas within the jurisdiction of the Justice Department. A prosecution and life sentence cannot bring back Ms. Heyer or undo the painful harm inflicted on so many others. But today's sentence makes clear that the Department of Justice will use the full resources of the federal government to prosecute hate-inspired violence wherever it occurs. Thank you. David. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Archie. I'm the special agent in charge of FBI Richmond. A little under two years ago, on August 12, 2017, Charlottesville was thrust into the national spotlight when violence erupted in the city. Heather Heyer was killed and many others injured on this day as a result of James Fields' actions, actions which Mr. Fields admitted were hate crimes. Our office worked closely throughout with the Office of the U.S. Attorney, the Virginia State Police, and the Charlottesville Police Department to quickly and thoroughly investigate this case. We are grateful for the professionalism, the partnership, and the commitment to justice of each. We are also grateful to the members of the public businesses and media outlets that came forward and shared information, information that was instrumental in us allowing to secure these convictions through this prosecution. 
I want to express our condolences to Heather's family, as well as, well, as well as our support of the other victims. The federal case concluded today with Mr. Fields' sentencing. However, our work is not done. To them and to Virginia, know that we will continue to work with our partners to protect Virginia's citizens from unlawful violence, including that which constitutes hate crimes or domestic terrorism, as these did, and hold those who commit these crimes accountable. Such crimes are not just an attack on the victims, but they are also meant to threaten and intimidate an entire community. And terrorism, this sentencing sends a message that terrorism and hatred-inspired violence have no place in our communities. Thank you all very much. So we have a large group, uh, but we're going to try to answer as many questions uh, as we can. In your, Mr. Cullen, in your argument, you were talking about the rising tide of hate in this country. Talk a little bit more about how this case is indicative of trends you're seeing and what message you hope to send, send to white supremacists and neo-Nazis and others. Sure. It's undisputed fact, first and foremost, that white supremacy, acts of domestic terrorism, and hate crimes are rising in this country. Uh, they have been uh, for several years. Uh, it is a priority of the Department of Justice to investigate individuals and groups, uh, not for having abhorrent political beliefs, racist views, or anti-Semitic views, but when they take additional steps and commit acts of violence, um, like in Charlottesville or in other locations. In, in arguing for a life sentence today, my message to the court, one of the factors the court has to consider is, will the sentence achieve a deterrence effect on the community at large? And with this backdrop of rising domestic terrorism and, and white supremacy and activity related to that, I believe that sending someone to prison for the rest of his life for manifesting in a violent way uh, those racist, anti-Semitic views sends that message and hopefully will send a message to groups and individuals uh, in the United States who may be tempted to act accordingly. Fields asked for mercy and the defense team argued that he should not spend the rest of his life in prison. Please detail a piece of evidence or several pieces of evidence that made you disagree with that. So I can't pinpoint one piece of evidence. Um, there was overwhelming evidence that, in our view, militated a life sentence in this particular case. This was calculated. It was cold-blooded. It was motivated by this deep-seated racial animus that, that he had demonstrated throughout the course of his life um, that was becoming more prevalent as he got older. Uh, in our view, even though he had suffered from some, some mental health uh, problems and behavioral problems, um, that did not justify going below the, the recommendation of the guidelines for a life sentence, particularly given the heinous nature of these crimes. Literally 30 people seriously injured, but for the fact that there were two cars parked at the end of 4th Street, you would have had at least a dozen people dead. That was his intent. That was clear from the evidence we presented, and ultimately I think that was convincing to the court. Yes, ma'am. There were 23 total. Uh, what total was who spoke today or just written? Including who spoke today. Okay. The judge uh, seemed to agree with your characterization of this as uh, domestic terrorism, although there were no uh, terrorism charges. Can you just talk a little bit about, about the way that the uh, – would the sentence have been more with terrorism charges? Mm -hmm. did, did, did it really matter that there weren't any terrorism charges? Sure. First and foremost, as a threshold matter, we didn't have – a domestic terrorism statute on the books that fit this crime. Uh, what we had available to us as federal prosecutors were these civil rights violations. In other words, engaging in acts of violence, in this case first-degree murder and causing serious bodily harm because of racial animus, uh, animus against folks that Congress has determined are deserving of, of protection. Um, in this case, we got a life sentence, um, so it's difficult to speak hypothetically, but I think it's important to note that there isn't a domestic terrorism statute on the books in the United States Code currently that we could have charged based on that underlying conduct. Um, what did you think of the apology? 
I, I, I'm still processing the apology. Um, and I think I'll defer to the victims and their families. Um, I'd like to hear their views before I give you mine on that. I have a question for Mr. Ar Mr. Archie. Sure. Um, out of your uh, FBI office in Richmond, uh, in the, as things stack up in your priority, where, where, do you, where do you place white supremacist, you know, potentially violent white supremacist groups? Number one, and number two, do you, can, can you tell us if, you, if there are any active investigations at all? I'm not asking for a specific one. Two questions, priority and any active investigations. We continue. I think you probably know the Bureau continues to hold counterterrorism as its number one priority. That does not, uh, that's no different in the Richmond Division. As far as specific cases, I'd rather not comment on that. We don't make a distinction between domestic terrorism and international terrorism when it comes to prioritization. Our goal there in all those cases, separate, distinct, maybe from investigating a crime that's already occurred, that's a prevention mission, and that remains our highest priority, domestic or international. So highest priority out of your Richmond office, that counterterrorism. That's correct. One of the highest priorities in the Richmond Division. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Yes, uh, one of the uh, victims uh, said that he was somewhat reluctant to come to the courthouse, uh, and she referenced uh, you know, the president's statement that there were good people on both sides in the uh, white supremacist march in Charlotte. I wonder if that statement per se by the president had made your job any harder in terms of prosecuting uh, white <coughs> racist and terrorist of all shapes and kinds. All I can do as the U.S. Attorney in the Western District of Virginia, all Eric can do in, in representing the Department of Justice is speak through our cases and our indictments. And we believe that we have spoken forcefully and clearly in bringing this case and in related cases associated with the Unite the Right movement. I condemn in, in no uncertain terms. Um, we did it as a legal matter. We obtained a life sentence today. So that's how I'm going to answer that question. Uh, we are committed, as the special agent in charge said, to making these cases a priority. We have been working incredibly hard over the last two years on these cases. We will continue to do so. And I would also point you to the new Attorney General, Mr. Barr, and his confirmation hearing and various remarks he has given since he's been confirmed. He has talked about the rising scourge and issue of domestic terrorism, the fact that this is a priority of this Department of Justice. It's reflected in, in the work Eric and his team is doing. But at the end of the day, all we can do is prosecute these cases, and hopefully doing these cases will send a message uh, that, that, that our government um, condemns this type of activity and will do all within our power to hold folks accountable. Any other questions? You said in the sentencing memorandum that there wasn't a lot of precedent for a case like this. You probably touched on it in other comments, but how does this set a precedent for future hate crime cases moving forward? It's an important precedent uh, in that it reflects by the combined effort of the folks uh, at this podium making it a priority, devoting the resources necessary to build a federal civil rights case um, when you had a state prosecution for murder, right? Begs the question, why do it at all? Separate and apart from a state prosecutor's interest in prosecuting murder, we as federal prosecutors in the U.S. Department of Justice have a vested interest in protecting the civil rights of citizens in the United States. Uh, and, and that was paramount and, and drove us in, in making decisions and doing other cases related to the Unite the Right rally. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we've talked about um, the message that you want to send out to people that are racist, but what about the message for the people that live here in Charlottesville? What do you what message do you want to send to them? Their lives have changed dramatically. My hope is um, Charlottesville is never going to be the same, right? Um, what happened on August 12, 2017. Uh, serves as a marker and it's indelible and it will be with this community in the Commonwealth of Virginia and our country 
for all time. It's my hope that from a law enforcement standpoint, the members of this particular community reflect that there's some good guys out there in the FBI, in the Virginia State Police, in the Charlottesville Police Department, who cared about these cases, who worked tirelessly to bring this guy to justice, and who are committed to doing the right thing. Any other questions? Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.